to our worship service for the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. We give thanks to God for the opportunity to share this time of worship with you uh, in this way that we've been doing for the past year or so. We also pray for those who are struggling, continue to struggle with the, um, the restrictions over the pandemic, and we pray for a resolution uh, as soon as possible. The liturgy that we follow is uh, in printed form, uh, available on our parish website at thelivelyanglican.ca under the news button. Uh, and so if you wish to access that information to help you uh, follow along with what we're doing, uh, that would be helpful to you. So let us begin. Dear friends, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins so that we may obtain forgiveness by God's infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved you as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord is in his holy temple. O oh, come, let us, let us worship. worship. We'll be singing the hymn through all the changing scenes of life, and I forgot to mention the fact that Mary Beth and I uh, live in the same place, and so we're in the same social bubble, which is the reason why our masks are not being worn today. In trouble and in joy, the praises of my God shall still my heart and tongue employ. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, Exalt the sacred name When in distress to heaven I called God to my rescue came The guardian hosts encamp around the dwellings of the just deliverance they provide to all who in God's shelter trust. O oh, make but trial of God's love experience will decide how blessed and favored are they all who in this love confide fear god you saints and you will then have nothing else to fear. Let service be your life's delight. Your wants shall be God's care. To Father, Son, 
and spirit blessed the God whom we adore be glory as it was is now and shall be Our first reading this morning is taken from the book of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is the first psalm in the Psalter. We'll share the reading responsively by the half verse. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes. Nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked is doomed. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from 
all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the words of my lips, the thoughts and the meditations of all our hearts will be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Begin my message with a question. On what or on whom do you rely? Now, if this were a Sunday school class, the answer, of course, is Jesus, because that's always the answer at Sunday school. And that's actually the correct answer. But if we're honest with ourselves, while that is our hope that we rely on Jesus, on what or on whom do we really rely? Do, do you rely on your good reputation of having people speak well of you? Is it devastating to you to have someone sully your reputation or speak unkindly about you? If that is what you rely on, then Jesus says, woe to you. Perhaps you rely on having enough food in the cupboard so that you'll never go hungry. I know of people who are somewhat obsessed about having freezers full and pantries bust, bursting. But again, Jesus says, woe to you. Because that is not what a healthy Christian life relies upon. Or finally, perhaps you rely on having money in the bank. Now, when I say you might rely on this, it doesn't mean there's anything terrible about having money in the bank or food in your cupboard or a good reputation. Jesus is saying, woe to you if wealth, food, or a good reputation has removed the need to rely on God. In the passage from Jeremiah, God criticizes the people who are depending on themselves or on their wealth to see them through the rough days instead of turning to God with their whole hearts. The psalmist praises those who are close to the water of God like trees by the stream and who have allowed their roots to grow deeply into the ground. And in Luke's version of the Beatitudes, Jesus warns those who are rich, full, and laughing that they may lose that which they are relying on, and tough times may come. In each of these passages, the reader is challenged to think about the source of their strength and their support. Hence my question, on what do you rely? St. Luke recounts a story of Jesus which occurs right after Jesus has spent the night in prayer and has named his 12 apostles. A disciple is a learner, an apostle is someone sent out with a message. So there is a slight distinction. Jesus' ministry has already attracted a great deal of attention. In addition to the band of disciples, which accounted for more than the 12 apostles, people from as far away as the Mediterranean coast had sought him out because of the news that people had been healed in his presence. We know 
that the healings were an outgrowth of the presence of the kingdom of heaven that was in Jesus, which was a pretty spectacular display. But Jesus' main purpose was to make disciples of all the nations. In the midst of a large crowd of onlookers, Jesus, in a sense, took his disciples aside and taught them that even though they were poor, hungry, and weeping, a day was coming in which they would be blessed. They would be blessed because of their reliance on God, their willingness to place their lives in the hands of Jesus. They had, you might say, planted their lives by the edge of the river of life by following Jesus as his disciples, and that would be their source of blessing. As disciples of Jesus, they were relying on their leader to be the source for what they would need to grow as people of God. In contrast, the others in the group who were not disciples may have been included in the second half of his statements about blessing and woes. In this second short list, we hear of things that many of us crave, such as money, food, laughter, and having people speak well of us. As I've already pointed out, it isn't that these things are bad in themselves, but to place them in the position of the source of what we need is a problem. It's the criticism leveled by God through Jeremiah and the contrast in Psalm 1. It's a matter of answering the question on what do you rely with the word God, not money, food, laughter, or good reports. The past two years has been quite a trial. There has been a tremendous increase in calls for mental health support, and there is plenty of evidence that stress is causing many problems. The pandemic restrictions can be viewed as a drought or some other deprivation. And those who are planted close to the stream of living water have, according to the psalmist, a better chance of thriving than those who follow the advice of the wicked or sit in the seat of scoffers. This does not mean that a drought doesn't affect the trees next to the rivers, particularly if the river dries up too. So what does it mean? Or what it does mean, rather, is that the depths of the roots make it possible for the tree to live through the difficulties and come out the other side with wholeness. The metaphor of a tree planted by water is a helpful one to many people, but how do we translate that into our own lives? Well, the psalmist has a suggestion. Happy are those whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. Delight in the law of the Lord, and meditate on it day and night. It would seem, at least to this psalmist, that the way to ensure we are ready for the troubles of life will, is, to throw, is to delight in the law of the Lord and to meditate on day and night. Jesus told his disciples on one occasion that he had come to fulfill the law, and so delighting in Jesus and meditating on his teaching day and night is a way to ensure that we are ready for the troubles life will throw our way. And among those elements of his teaching are the statements from the gospel passage we hear today. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Disciples of Jesus are citizens of the kingdom of God, and this reality can and should be a source of encouragement and strength because we can enjoy some of the benefits of that citizenship right now. Disciples of Jesus has, as he promised, the Holy Spirit residing within us to guide and encourage us and, rem and remind us of the things that Jesus taught us. Meditation on the law of the Lord includes meditation on Jesus' words and the interpretation of those words through the agency of the Holy Spirit. One of the benefits of that citizenship in heaven is that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, according to Hebrews, along with the promise from Jesus that he will be with us always, even until the end of the age, as he said, recorded at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Then Jesus said, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Hunger is not pleasant. But Jesus promises his disciples 
that they will be filled, and so encourages them to endure the hunger with hope. You recall the story in the nation of Israel while they were fleeing from Egypt. They learned that God could bring food to the hungry in surprising ways. Manna appeared on the ground in the morning to provide bread, and occasionally flocks of birds would be driven into their midst in order to provide for their physical needs. We pray on a regular basis, give us this day our daily, our daily bread, which is a statement of our reliance on God to make sure we have food. Do we trust that, that statement? So if we are hungry now, we will be filled, Jesus promised, because God is concerned about this work, about our physical needs. It may mean that the food will be provided through a soup kitchen or a food bank, or it may come in a surprise basket left on our doorstep. But God does provide food for the hungry. Then he said, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. This is a promise that disciples of Jesus will get through their times of sorrow to the day when they can laugh about their troubles. This happens when we can look back on the sorrow from a stable and a joyous place. I don't know many people who look forward to weeping, but it is a part of our lives after all. Tragedy does strike. Disasters do happen. Illness affects us all. So weeping is to be expected. Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus, for instance. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. And on the night before he was crucified, he wept in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we know that it is within the will of God for us to weep. But as St. Paul urges, we are not to mourn as those who have no hope. As deep as the despair may be, God is ready and able to accompany us through it into a better day. The blessing comes because of God's faithfulness, and so we can rely on God in this kind of situation and all others we meet. And then Jesus said, blessed are you when people hate you when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. I don't know anyone who enjoys being excluded or reviled. So it's difficult to understand how to rejoice while these things are happening. The disciple of Jesus is encouraged to hold on to a future perspective and remember that throughout history, the people whom God has sent with his message have been treated rather poorly. It's important to remember that this negative treatment needs to be motivated because we are working on Jesus' behalf, and not so much because we're not really nice people. If we're being treated badly because of our own bad behavior, we can't really claim this promise. A disciple of Jesus who is relying on everyone thinking well of them is relying on the wrong thing. And so, it's our choice regarding on whom or on what we rely. Jeremiah, the psalmist, and Jesus urge us to rely on God with the assurance that by doing so, we will be blessed in the end. Amen. We use the words of, hear, O Israel, in this season as our affirmation of faith. Please join me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And in reflection of the gospel reading, we sing the hymn, Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see our God. The 
secret of the Lord is theirs, their soul is Christ's abode. The Lord who left the heavens our life and peace to bring, to dwell in lowliness with us, our pattern and our king. Still to the lowly soul his presence doth impart, and for a dwelling and a throne chooseth the pure in heart. Lord, we thy presence seek, may ours this blessing be. Give us a pure and lowly heart, a temple meet for thee. It is from that pure and lowly heart that we offer our prayers and our praises, our thanksgivings and our petitions. We bring to God those things that are in our hearts and, and that are on our mind. We bring to God the fact that we are part of a of a parish fellowship made up of all sorts of households. And this coming week, we offer uh, our prayers on behalf of Des Ricard, Michael, and Joan Peters. And we also offer our prayers for those who have requested prayers for healing or uh, other kinds of support. And so we pray for Wendy and Thelma, and Vivian and Junior, Spruce and Greg and Sherry. We also pray for those frontline workers who continue to serve in the midst of this pandemic, even after all this time. We are also praying for our Archbishop Anne Germond, who celebrates her fifth anniversary of consecration this weekend. And in the prayer cycle for the diocese, it is our turn in this parish to be prayed for by the rest of the diocese. We offer our own prayers for ourselves. Using the litany, in peace let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For peace from on high and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our bishops and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Elizabeth, our queen, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We give thanks for all the saints who have found favor in your sight from earliest times, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and those whose names are known to you alone. And we pray that we too may be counted among your faithful, your faithful witnesses. Lord, have mercy. We pray for this town, this city of greater Sudbury, for every city and community, and for those who live in them in faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, for good weather and for abundant harvest for all to share, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel by land, water, or air, for the sick and the suffering, particularly those we have prayed for, for prisoners and captives and for their safety, health, and salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, strife, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. You have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together, you will hear their requests. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as may be best for us, 
granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come eternal life. For you, Father, are good and loving, and we glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And the collect for the day as we pray together, saying, Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're now closing our liturgy with the hymn, Eternal God, Lord of all space and time. God, Lord of all space and time, the source of truth and righteousness and grace, we thank thee that thy majesty sublime thou dost reveal in every human face. We Thank thee, Lord, for love's deep fount of joy, for inward peace that never can be told, for comradeship no changes can destroy, for faith and hope that all our days end. For love uniquely makes us one with Thee, remolding us according to Thy will, enabling us in true humanity, the purpose of Thy kingdom to fulfill. Fixed deeper than the source of human strife, may we in love a steadfast anchor find. Do thou unchanging through the stress of life, to thine own love our hearts forever. Peace of God, that peace that passes understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and in the love of God and of His Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us depart in joy and in peace to love and serve the risen Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be.